in this video we're going to have a look at half-life um, in particular we're going to look at how we can use that concept to do some sorts of calculations um, and you can see that over here this is from data but also using graphs to get information out of that we'll also have a look at some safety precautions and we'll start with that actually because it's slightly easier and how we can stay safe when we're dealing with radioactivity so what effects do radiation have on living things and bear in mind, we're not talking about infrared radiation here. I know it's confusing that we're using the word radiation again. This is ionizing radiation, and the clue's in that name. Now, the problem with ionizing radiation is this. Well, the key idea is that it can damage the DNA, which we can see here. Now, DNA is in every cell, and when ionizing radiation, remember ionizing means either alpha, beta, or gamma, or also X-rays are ionizing as well, um, comes into your body. What it does is it causes ionization. What is ionization? Well, that's when you go from some, from an atom to an ion. And this happens when something becomes charged. The way it does this um, is by, we take an atom, here's the nucleus, and here are some electrons. What it does is when the radiation comes in, let's say it's an alpha particle, that's big, it's quite positive, it's very good at knocking electrons out. And that's gonna cause this atom to just have its nucleus no electron in this case so it's going to be a positive ion this is now ionized the problem with that is that it can then interact with this backbone of the dna you don't need to know this but which can lead to these mutations which we mentioned here now a mutation is a incorrect coding i suppose now, the problem with that is often your body just deals with it absolutely fine your white blood cells attack it the cells die but what can happen is that mutation can lead to cancer cancer is where your own cells and this is one of your cells multiply quickly producing lots more of those incorrect cells and that's a tumor so it can lead to cancer well it doesn't always but it can do if it's in very high doses it just kills the cells and you get radiation burns how do you avoid this well there's a lot of ideas in this simpsons image here um if it's particularly radioactive and there's a chance it could get on your hands you can wear gloves or a protective suit although you don't often do that in a lab what we do often use though is large tongs which you can see here that keeps the radiation away from us and Alpha can only go a certain distance, as we know through air, about four centimeters. So we're going to be safe from alpha. So the key ideas are one, keep the exposure to time as short as possible. Two, wear gloves and protective suits if appropriate. Use long tongs. And we also store it in a lead lined box, which you can see down here. That's what we do. We put the isotope here in schools, especially. And we bring it out. The lead lined box absorbs all alpha and beta and most of gamma only a tiny bit of gamma will get through that we can also monitor exposure times this is particularly done in hospitals for radiographers they can monitor it with a badge this changes color if they've been exposed too much and therefore that assures that they keep the exposure time as short as possible in industry we also use robotic arms you see them dealing with radioactive isotopes behind this screen it's really thick glass um, and therefore these workers aren't exposed to too much radiation now let's get some amusing memes out of the way first of all. Um, carbon dating, hilarious. And radio of cats have 18 half lives. Well, the key idea here is that these two, the way carbon dating works, which is how we date um, old materials, it might be skeletons, we can use the idea of half lives to work out how old um, the uh, whatever it is is. So let's see what half life is all about. Now the definition of half life, well, there's two you can opt for. One, is the time taken for the radioactivity to half. So let's say we start with uh, 100 Becquerels. Now Becquerels are, is a measure of um, radioactivity. It's the number of counts per second, okay? So 100 Becquerels mean that there are 100 beeps or 100 counts or 100 alpha, beta, gamma particles per second. So in this definition, it's the time taken for that to fall to half its value. The other option is the time taken for half the radioactive nuclei to decay. Well, see how that's related. If we have half the radioactive nuclei, we're going to have half the radioactive count. So given it's a time, and don't forget in the exam, it's really important you mention the time taken, because it is a time, so the units are time units. Any of those, depending on which is the most sensible. Some have very short half-lives, so they decay very quickly. Some have very long half-lives, for example, uranium, it's in the billions of years, so that takes ages to decay. This image here shows it quite nicely. You see at the start we have all these radioactive isotopes, um, nuclei, sorry, and after one half-life, you see that half of them have decayed 
to form the daughter nuclei, which may be radioactive or may not be. You can see here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, we have about 16 still radioactive nuclei. So after another half-life, that's going to drop to eight, which you can see represented here. Oh, excuse me. So there's eight remaining. So after each half-life, we're halving the number of radioactive nuclei, or we're halving the radioactivity. This will go down to 25 and so on. Eventually, however, obviously it's not going to go to 12.5, so it will either be 13 or 12. It's random, so obviously it does bounce around a bit. But eventually, this will just be swamped by background count, and it will plateau out. Let's have a look at a graph now. So imagine we set up a radioactive isotope iodine-131, put it next to a Geiger-Muller counter. So it's a GM counter. Geiger-Muller tube, that's the thing that does the detecting, and then that goes to a counter, which tells us how many counts which we can plot on these axes. This is the radioactive isotope here. Now, it starts with 100 counts per second, or 100 becquerels. Now we're looking for the half-life. Well, hopefully you remember that's time taken for the radioactivity to half. So if we go down to 50, which is here, and draw across with a nice straight, clear line, it shouldn't be that thick really, use a thin pencil, and then dot down, see that we're getting a half-life just a bit below 200, and actually it is about 192 for iodine-131. That means every 192 hours, the radioactivity will half. Now the joy of this is, you can do that from any number. We could go 60 to 30. We could also go 50 to 25, which is, there's 30. 25 is going to be somewhere along here. And if we dot across, and you'd use a ruler in the exam, you can see that this distance here, that time there, I should say, is about 192. Well, not exactly, because we don't know exactly, but it's going to be very similar to that. Eventually this will tail out, and that remaining part will be background radiation. Remember, you often have to take that into account. Just make sure you practice some exam questions. Background radiation. Oops, excuse my handwriting there. Now, another isotope of iodine, 135 this time. Again, you can do the same process. Starts 100, dot across at 50, dot down. You see we get a much shorter half-life for this isotope. So remember, the half-life is dependent on the isotope you have. In this case, iodine 135 is much shorter and therefore will decay quicker than the other one. Let's have a look at an example question here. Feel free to pause it and read it in your own time and have a go at it if you'd like, but I'm going to go through it now. So a sample of radioactive material is placed near a detector, probably a Geiger Miller counter, they're the best. A count rate of 4,800 counts per second is detected. After 36 hours, the count rate has fallen to 600 counts. How many more, so it's saying more, so it doesn't want how many hours from the start, how many more hours must pass for the count rate to fall to 150? Now, what I always like to do is start off with the initial count rate, which is 4,800. Now, it's going to take 36 hours for to fall to 600. So let's see how many half-lifes have passed to get to 600. So 4,800 after one half-life, We'll go to 2,200, I've just divided it by 2, and then divide it by 2 again to get up to 1,100, um, and then, oh sorry, I made a mistake there, I thought that wasn't going to work, it's 2,400 and 1,200 there, and then it halves again to get 600. Now, that is, now a common mistake here is that most people say, well that's four half-lifes, because I've got four numbers there. No, it's only halved once, twice, and three times, so that's three half-lives have passed. And that's equivalent to, as it says in the question, 36 hours of time. So we know that this whole process takes 36 hours. So therefore we know that one half-life, excuse me, one, one half-life is equal to 36 divided by three, which is 12 hours. So the joy now is that we know the half-life of this isotope. So we know that every 12 hours, it's going to half. Now it's saying how much longer is it to get to 150? Well, we need how many more half-lives? Let's have a look. So 600 is going to drop to 300, and then to 150. Now remember, don't count the numbers. You're counting the arrows. That's one half-life here, and two here. So we've got two half-lives passing, each worth, excuse me, 12 hours. So that, so that tells me that the total time 
is going to be 24 hours. Make sure you don't forget your units. Never best not to write shorthand hours. That doesn't mean much. Write hours in full like that. So after 24 hours, we know 24 further hours. Remember, it's not how many more hours. 24 hours after this point here will be at 150. Total time will be 36 plus 24 if they ask for that. Let's have a look at one more question now. So thorium 232, excuse me, thorium 232 has a half-life of 1.4 times 10 to the 10 years. So it's very long. That means it's very stable or relatively stable isotope. It takes a long time to decay. So if I release it into this room that I'm in now, it's still going to be there, not decayed, probably by the end of the day. Well, definitely by the end of the day. Now, at a particular instant, the activity of the sample of thorium 232 is 120 becquerels. Calculate the time taken for the activity of the sample to fall to 15 becquerels. So we're starting at 120 becquerels. Now remember, every half-life, this is going to half. So after one half-life, we're at 60. Two will be at 30. And three will be at 15 becquerels. So that corresponds to one. Oh, there we go again. One, two, three half-lives passed. So three half-lives times by the half-life of this isotope will tell me the total time that has passed. We type that into a calculator. We get 4.2. I could have done that in your head, actually. 4.2 times 10 to the 10. 3 times 1.4 gives me 4.2, and then times 10 to the 10. And don't forget your time units. In this case, it's in years. It's the same as for the um, half-life. Now, it's really important you practice some of these questions and also get an idea of what half-life means in terms of wordy sort of questions. For example, let's say we had two isotopes, X and Y. One has a half-life of 10 minutes and one has a half-life of, I don't know, 10 hours. And sometimes they might ask you which one you'd use in certain situations. Now, for example, if I was going to inject something into you, use it as a tracer, that's one of the uses of isotopes, you probably want something that's shorter half-life so that it decays quickly um, that, and therefore passes out of your body or becomes stable and therefore less harmful pretty quickly. For example, if we're using a tracer that goes into a water source, we'd want to use a relatively short half-life. We wouldn't want to use one that has half-life of, say, 10 years. Otherwise, it'll still be hanging around emitting radioactivity um, many years after it's been put in. So it's always a good idea to think carefully about the half-life. And the half-life tells you the time it takes for half nuclei to decay. So a higher half-life, so a longer half-life, I should say, rather than higher, I suppose, longer half-life means it's going to be, it's going to stay around for longer, so longer life. But it also means it's emitting less radioactivity initially. So I suppose actually if you were to eat this isotope, it wouldn't be so much an issue because it would pass through your body. Maybe one or two would decay emitting some radiation, which would be dangerous. Most of it's going to come out the other end before it's even got anywhere near much of it decaying. This one, if you ate it, would be the most dangerous because it's inside you and every 10 minutes it's emitting, or 10, every 10 minutes half the radioactive nuclei decaying, emitting their radiation into your body. Um, while it's there, and then it will have decayed, well, after about five or six half-lives, most of it will have decayed. Also, just don't forget, when you're doing these questions, don't forget that, remember, the grass will always look something like this. This remaining part is background radiation. Remember, that's the radiation that's all around us, from rocks, from the food we eat, the drinks we drink, and so on. So you sometimes have to take that into account in questions. Thank you.